we are going to be talking to the one and only Dr. Shafali. Uh, so for those of you who don't know Dr. Shafali's um, first book, she's got a bunch of books, but her first book, The Conscious Parent, totally changed the game mm -hmm. for me as a parent. I know for you too, Danae, it was totally groundbreaking and just altered everything, right? Mind blowing. So she has a new book coming out, The Parenting Map. And um, I jumped at the opportunity to have a conversation with her because she's we're fangirls. So we're super excited to, to yeah. do this live. Um, and then we're also going to turn this into a podcast episode. So if you can't stay for the whole thing, or, you know, if you miss this, don't worry, it'll be uh, on our podcast as well. So hello, Dr. Dr. Shafali. Hi, how are you guys? Thank you for having me. So I know one of you is Vanessa. And That's that me. Vanessa. <laughs> and who's that? I'm Danae. We're so excited oh. to have this opportunity. So nice to meet you. So, How exciting. Um, the reason why I have Danae on here, Dr. Shafali, so her and I have, we're both therapists. Um, we're both mamas of young little ones. Mine's three, <laughs> hers is five. But we also have a podcast together. So when I found out that your book was coming out, they asked, oh, do you want her on the pod or live? And I was like, I would love a live so that our listeners can, you know, or our viewers, listeners, whatever we call our Instagram family can watch. But also, Danae, please join because I think it'll be a great conversation. Oh, my goodness. I'm I'm so excited to talk to two therapists. So thanks for having me. And uh, this is the book we're talking about. It's Yay. my latest book. It's called The Parenting Map. And, uh, you know, I wrote the book, The Conscious Parent mm -hmm. and several other books. And those books were more about explaining why we need a new parenting paradigm. Mm. But this one is the how to. It's uh, 20 yeah. steps. It's three stages. And, and just before we begin the conversation, mm -hmm. I posted uh, my free summit. I'm going to do it again here. So it's for free, guys. If you want to pin that, uh, Amazing. Vanessa, you can right. just pin I will. it to the top. It's happening right now. So people can join right away. Jump in. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's so exciting. And you know what? You took the words out of my mouth because the first question I was actually going to ask you is, can you tell us a little bit what is different, right? Because what we were saying before you joined is the conscious parent was a game changer for Danae and I. Um, and so I was reading the new book and I was thinking, oh, this is similar, but yes, it's like a very step-by-step -step kind of tangible tools, which maybe because the conscious parent came out when 2010, do you feel like that came from, or this book came from just more practice with people and actually getting it into like, here's a tangible thing that you can do to achieve this? Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Well, first, when I wrote I like the conscious that. parent, I was, uh, you know, kind of breaking ground, right? It was, mm -hmm. it was one of the first times people had heard about the ego. I had not heard about the ego till I began writing about conscious parenting. No one told me mm -hmm. that my parenting was going to be ego driven. I thought, yeah, you know, I'm going to be selfless. I'm going to be amazing and superior at this job. Mm -hmm. And little did I realize, because it's the world's best secret, that we parents are really driven from fear. You know, we project all our wounds. And that's what was in the driver's seat. I was horrified when I saw my ego because mm -hmm. no one prepared mm -hmm. me. So when I wrote The Conscious Parent, I was really breaking ground. A lot of parents were pissed off at me. I got a lot of <laughs> resistance, a lot of resistance and upset clients. It wasn't good for my business. Mm. And then over the, so yes, over 13 years now yep. of working with people, I started a coaching institute. I trained people to do this. So now, now I think parents are more ready for this concept. And now they want to really practice it. So this is that practice manual. Uh, it has practice exercises. It has very clear illustrations. It's great for the guys in your life. You know, guys like step by step. So uh, <laughs> it's really, it just breaks it down very simply. I finally found a way to communicate it very simply. Love it. Dr. Shafali, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity just really to thank you for your work um you know one of my favorite books is the prophet by khalil gibran and there's a part of the book where he talks about on children and that your children are not your children um they are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself and i remember before i became a parent feeling like this is the way i would like to parent my child and i feel like your work has given me such tangible tools for how to execute that way of parenting oh. and constantly I'm sharing your work with clients, but I would love to hear how you came to that understanding. Is that the way that you were parented or is this a little bit 
more of um, your own spiritual practices have led you to this understanding of what it is to parent a child? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your words. Yes, so I have been practicing meditation since I was in my early 20s. And I've been a student of, of psychology. I was doing my PhD, actually, when I uh, became a mom. So I thought I was, you know, absolved from any parental folly, you know, any parental <laughs> shadow i thought i was like going to float on on top of the world mm. and then when i saw myself uh with such crippling anxiety frustration anger like i had so much rage yeah. uh because my movie wasn't coming true right mm. and i was taking it out on my kid till one day you know after many moments i had an epiphany that wow i'm not even raising the child before me mm -hmm. i'm just trying to fit her into my fantasy and then it just dawned on me that this is what we are all doing that's why we became parents we didn't become a parents to you know get pushed back and to to raise a sovereign being we became parents subconsciously to get to have a mini me and when i saw myself doing that to my kid because that was not my conscious intention it was mm -hmm. my unconscious drive i was just mortified and i i i had to make a choice do i want to murder my child's spirit or do i want to align with it and allow it to blossom and where was my fantasy coming from it was mm -hmm. coming from my own unmet fantasies about myself um and so it just yeah. was a was an epiphany, it was a paradigm shift, but no one was talking about it back then. So now it's become a movement because of moms like you. And uh, now I feel because people understand the, the what and the why, now they're ready for the how. And uh, this is that uh, 20 step manual. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I think, yeah. Okay. Go ahead, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just to what you were just speaking to, I think I heard you say in an interview a long time ago that, you know, we come up with the idea that we are meant to raise our children to be good people. And I heard you respond with saying, like, what gave us the idea that our children are not good people? And I remember it was such a paradigm shift for me, because I think we have this idea that you know, a lot of times when I'm sitting with parents, what I hear them speaking to is sort of the catastrophe that's circling in their head. If, if I don't get this under control now, they're in the future gonna be this horrible person. And a lot of times it's the projection of what I experienced and what I'm afraid from what my life experience has been, but that's not really about them, right? Right, and the world is a scary place filled with great unconsciousness. But if we operate from the what if, and there are a million what ifs, right? You can, mm -hmm. I mean, you can spend months creating what if scenarios because each what if in your head has happened somewhere okay. in Milwaukee, in Tibet, in Uzbekistan, it's happened somewhere. Yeah. So you, you feel legitimized to have the what if, but children are right here in the what is. And in our fear of the what if, we are missing the what is. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're actually crippling our children uh, because of this fear, All, albeit the world is a scary place, but constantly telling them that life is suffering and, you know, the world is hard and it's, it's and full of angry, unconscious people will actually debilitate them. The, mm. the way to help our children have resilience is education, yes, but we need to show them that they who they are is more than whole, mm. more than worthy, not always telling them you need to learn more you need to do more you need to be more then they go out into the world with this empty bucket versus going out to the world with this fullness and then dealing with the world's issues right right yeah you know there's there's a part in the book that i thought was really interesting where you talk about how um you know, this is not, some might perceive this as passive parenting and it's not. And Danae and I've spoken about this because I think sometimes that's the pushback that I'll hear from parents is that this conscious way of parenting is like a passive way of parenting. And I'd love if you could speak more about that because Danae and I don't see it that way because this to me feels way harder actually yes. than, than what real passive parenting is. But I'd love to hear kind of your clarification or the, the separation of those two, yeah? 
Yes, yes. It's so funny. People say that, oh, this is negligent <laughs> parenting because yeah. this is hell on wheels parenting. This is like, <laughs> because, because you can't escape. You see yeah. your ego everywhere. So there's no lying. There's no manipulation here because you are so raw, so honest, so authentic. This is painful to be like this because you have to really show up and you can't bullshit maneuver your children and puppeteer them anymore. You have to be of the highest integrity. So this is way harder. But yes, they, they think it's permissive parenting because I really attack the belief system that parents need to be in control. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. I do talk about how parents need to be in charge. And there's a big mindset difference between being in control and the arrogance and the superiority that that comes with mm -hmm. versus being in charge. Being in control is a delusion that comes from this God complex that parents have that we can actually control anything. We can barely even control our own lives. We can barely control our own minds. What are we talking about? Yeah. But mm -hmm. because there's this uh, childism that exists, you know, children are our puppets, they are our possessions. We have this antagonism towards them that we can just, you know, do with them whatever we want. No, we cannot. And actually, if we keep doing to them what we want versus aligning with them, we will create unsustainability. They will fall apart as they do, and they will rebel or get into drugs because they're looking for a resonance to who it is they yeah. are. Being in charge means that you're very active and you're very present, I mean, unbelievably present, but you are more focused not on the controlling of the human, but the creating the conditions mm. for them to rise. So instead of telling them all day long, don't eat the cookie, don't eat the cookie, you just throw out the damn cookie. You know, <laughs> in, instead, of, instead of telling them not to be materialistic, don't spend so much money, you just don't have the money, just don't have it. Mm -hmm. Don't buy expensive mm -hmm. things. If mm -hmm. you want to teach them to be uh, mindful around screen time, well, think very clearly before you give them the screens, right? So. Everything can be managed if you look at it as um, creating the environment. Mm. You are, you're creating the, the sanctum, but you're not controlling how they are in the sanctum. Because once the sanctum is created, they will fall into alignment with that mm. beautiful space. Does that mean they won't get into trouble? Does that mean they won't be silly, goofy and make mistakes or hate math? No, it, they will do what they need to do in their essence. But you're taking care of the conditions. How do I show up? How is mm -hmm. my home set up? Uh, what are my, my values? And that's what you keep your, your eye on. I really I have. I'm, can I just have one really quick thing today? So I'm laughing because, so my little one's three. And last week, I, we took her to the dentist. You know, she goes every six months. And the dentist is older. And she laughed because she said, my daughter's teeth are really good. And she said, she goes, you're not one of those new parents who doesn't want to force her to brush her teeth because you want to keep the connection, right? You force her to brush her teeth. <laughs> and I said, and I said, yeah, I do force her to brush her teeth. So let's talk and we about had a laugh. That. So I'm, I'm yes. curious, like, I know that's kind of funny, but, but that little type of thing, like the, like the screaming match that my daughter and I get into two times a day mm. around brushing her teeth, right? Like that to me feels like a tangible, I hear parents speak about this, like, okay, yeah, in theory, that's great. But like, they have to brush their damn teeth. So like, how do we get past those like struggles in the moment? Yes, it's so beautiful. What a great thing you brought up because yes, there is a tendency for the parent today to mistake conscious parenting as let's make our kids happy parenting, you know? Yes. Let's just, let's just please not have any conflict parenting. Please let's just indulge our children parenting. Okay, so that's not what conscious parenting is about. Conscious parenting really understands the difference between ego enhancing boundaries and life enhancing boundaries. And I talk about that in my book, grab mm -hmm. a copy of my book, The Parenting Map. So ego enhancing boundaries are things like the parent wanting the kid to uh, wear color coordinated clothes and become a prima ballerina. That's the parent's ego. Yes. But life enhancing boundaries are brush your teeth, have a shower, make your bed, be, <laughs> you know, be in society without being a cannibal, you know, being rude and, and you know what I mean? Not, you know, yeah. nothing, nothing against someone who may be a cannibal in some past life, you know, but just, just if they had to survive, just 
understanding that there are boundaries around yeah. things that are life enhancing. You know, in today's world, we got to go to school, some kind of school. We have to because it'll enhance your life in this world. So it's not about not doing it. But let's talk about why children resist toothbrushing, for example, mm -hmm. or why they they scream bloody murder around their socks. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a hole in their socks. Or why they scream bloody murder around um, anything small that you may perceive as small. Children have control over very little things in their life. And they are highly sensorial, like taste, touch. Th these things matter to them. Their brain is not yet developed to integrate strange things to their palate or strange things to their body, perhaps. Mm. So when they're screaming bloody murder around toothbrush or toothbrushing, they are genuinely struggling. So instead of going into a head to head battle with them, we need to put in the effort to be creative, to make them see that this is something fun. They don't have to be scared. You know, the first thing you drop your kids to kindergarten, they will have a very hard time, perhaps for three months. But they're not being bad kids. They're not being abnormal kids. They're just struggling with the transition, which brings about lack of control, some lack of control. So we need to be creative, you know, make them brush the doll's teeth. You brush your teeth, make them brush your teeth. And then within days, they will align. But we just think that we should command them and they mm. should just follow. And that model brings up resistance because children want to feel in control as well. So this book really helps parents to understand it's not about the kid being a bad kid. It's about how can the kid feel empowered to actually be yes. influenced by you. But you need to empower them to be influenced by you. Mm -hmm. It's an empowerment. It's not a control. I love that. I feel like what you're saying about being in charge to me feels like the differentiation between power over versus power with your yes. child. And, yes. you know, I love about this book so much I was reading it this weekend is that you give all of these concrete examples my five-year-old is in a very like I hate you mommy phase like you're the best mommy in the world you're the worst mommy in the world like and it's like between like two minute spans but I think you talk about when your child is in that space of I hate you if I can go inward and tend to what comes up for me when he says that and like why my ego starts to like fire and like I'm a bad mom all of these things that come up and sort of say tend to that within me first and then seek to understand what that's about. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd been traveling a lot for work in January and I sort of made the connection that a lot of this, like, I hate you, mommy, is a little bit of like, are you going to go away if I push you away, mommy? You know, but if I sort of jump into the like, that hurts my feelings when you say that to me, I'm not able to meet him there. And I am sort of making it about me versus yes. about what's happening for me. Right. I can guarantee you that every time a child says, I don't like you or I hate you, or they are really saying, I don't like it. Mm. I hate it. And because our egos are so big, all we hear is an attack and a personalization. But children are just saying, I hate something about something that's that's happening between us. And we just need to remember that a five-year-old cannot articulate. Yeah. It's much easier for them to say, I hate you versus to say, I'm afraid that when I grow up, I will have abandonment issues. So can you please not leave me all the time? <laughs> They're just going to say, I hate it, but not know how to say it articulately. So it's much quicker and easier to say, oh, I hate what you're doing to me. I hate what you're mm -hmm. doing to me in this moment. And we just have to keep reframing it for ourselves. But if our ego rises, then we attack back and then they feel ashamed for having had big feelings and then they truly will begin to disconnect from us. So I have a question because I think what? one of the things that comes up constantly with the couples, I'm primarily a couples therapist and it's constantly like our philosophies don't match. So if one parent is very much in alignment with everything that you're saying and how to approach this a little bit more consciously. And the other parent is like, nope, we're meant to be in charge and we need to be disciplining in this way. And what do we do when we're sort of out of alignment with our partner in terms of what we should be doing or what the goal should be in terms of yeah, parents? It's, it's like really a good question. <laughs> very good question. It's the most common question. It's within the first three questions I get asked. And, and my answer may not be uh, reassuring, but it is a little bit relieving, I think, mm -hmm. when I say that all you need is one conscious parent. Now, we would love to have 
a village of conscious parents, a world of conscious parents. But we know that because we were raised with so much control and fear, it's not possible to have people on the same page of consciousness. So for the parent who is starting their journey and is reading this book, I applaud them. That is so powerful. It's better to have one conscious parent than to have zero. Mm. But mm. It, 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 the idea that it'll confuse the children is wrong. It won't confuse the children because children don't like our unconsciousness. So if you had two unconscious parents, they would feel trapped. They would feel outnumbered. They would feel silenced and suppressed. But if they just have one person that they can go to, to vent, to express, to process, to integrate, to when that parent tells that kid, listen, I know that, you know, your dad or your mom just lost their shit on you. It's not your fault. You know, mm. have, you, have you seen grandma? Like it's grandma, you know, um, <laughs> you know your, your, your poor dad grew up or your poor mom grew up, you know, in a very strict house. So she doesn't know how to handle when you break the rules, but it's okay. I got you. I understand you, you know, mm -hmm. imagine just hearing that as a child, that it's not our fault. We don't have to feel responsible for our, ch our parents' pain, our parents' lack of control. That is gold. So yes, it is hard for that one parent to stand up and, and face the unconsciousness of the other parent, mm -hmm. but it's better that, that they do that. And I always say, chase consciousness, don't chase uh, being a wife or a husband. Your role in life is not to be, can I, am I a good wife or am I a good husband? Forget that. Mm -hmm. You are supposed mm -hmm. to be a conscious human being. So you go for consciousness. You know, if your partner is a racist person, don't care about whether you're a good partner to your unconscious partner. Care about consciousness. And mm -hmm. that takes courage. Listen, that takes courage because we're so ingrained to say, you know what, be on the same page as your partner. Yes, be on the same page as your partner if it's the page of consciousness. But if it's utter unconsciousness, that's where it gets tricky and you have to be really brave to be that conscious harbor for your children. Now mm -hmm. you have children, like it's no joke. You cannot allow that person's unconsciousness to wreck your children's life just because they're not growing. Uh-uh. Yeah. yeah. Right? Amen, amen. Danae and I talk all the time about how we live in such a codependent society and it's what primes us, not only romantically, but our relationships with our children, right? We are, we are served this idea that codependency is love and that's what it looks like and feels like to be in love. And I think Danae and my like mission on this planet is to break that down. And so we're obsessed with everything you do because you have a very similar way of talking about relationships. Again, whether it's parent, whether it's you know, partnered, family, doesn't matter. Exactly. It is that enmeshment of being one unit moving as one, which is so unhealthy because mm. each one of us has a, a point of autonomy, a point of sovereignty that we need to uphold and celebrate. And it's OK if you, you know, are not similar to your partner. I mean, that's healthy. No two people can be exactly, you know, it's, it's a front, right? We say a mm. united front. It's a front, exactly. It's fake. Yep. It's, it's not possible. The goal is not to have too much conflict in front of your children, but the goal is also to have autonomy and sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So we need mm -hmm. to celebrate that. And children should not be afraid to not be part of this mass unit amoeba, amoeba-like uh, single cell organ uh, that the family is. Uh, family is meant to honor and allow for sovereignty. And we need to model that. And it's okay to disagree with your partner and to teach your child, I'm not anyone's puppet. I have my own views and I'm going to speak up and share my views. Ugh. Yeah, I mean, one of the lines or things that I think Vanessa and I both have heard you speak to that we were like screaming like, yes, as you say, the goal of a conscious parent is to make themselves irrelevant. And I think that can be really, really difficult to hear in a society where we're just taught so much of our identity should be wrapped up in our role as parent. But yes. what I see happen so often is that the clients that I work with are really holding themselves back from fully living their lives because of what this is going to mean for mom or, you know, their expectations of what I should be or do. And I think there's so many ways where by not continuing to fully live as parents and step back a little bit from what we've been taught we should be doing and involved in all the time for our kids, we can really be, um, impacting who they are 
meant to become or who they have the opportunity to become in this life. Exactly. Again, again because we have given this uh, illusion to parents that they are these superior beings, almighty, in charge of their children forever and ever, and they've been given the task to mold these puppets, parents begin to think that they are to be needed. Mm. And that's yes. their identity. Our identity is that we need to be needed. We don't see how that cripples our children. And if you create irrelevance, it scares you as a parent if your identity has been relevance, right? Mm -hmm. If you gain your identity from your significance in your child's life, right? You know, so many parents will tell me, you know, my, my daughter calls me every morning and I cringe. I go, oh, how old is she? They're like, oh, she's 32. And I go, okay, that, that may be, it may be lovely, but it may be a lot of enmeshment. So, but, but the point is not what the daughter does. The point is the high that the mother gets from thinking that this can only be a good thing. Yes, yes. Not realizing that this is unhealthy. This pattern of enmeshment may not be the most functional. And again, it's our fear of being who it is we are without that child needing us, right? Mm -hmm. So we need them to need us. We need them to think we're amazing mm. and that's our own disease because we use this role to give us worth and um i talk about all of this guys if you want to become a conscious parent this is the book it's called the parenting map it's 20 steps it's my latest book i'm so grateful that you invited me to your instagram and i've posted the link to my free summit uh please find it it's summit.drshafali.com it's completely free all of you go join right now. It's a fabulous lineup of speakers. Um, and thank you guys thank for you. having me. And I, I'd so love to much. stay in touch. Yeah, just so grateful for this opportunity to thank you for your work, Dr. Shafali. It's just, you're having such an impact. I really yeah. appreciate you. Truly. I, I, I don't want to get off the line, but, <laughs> but, but please stay in touch.